In 1937, China is in the middle of the Second Sino-Japanese War. A group of soldiers has been given the mission of protecting the international settlement of Shanghai, but to reach the city, they first need to cross the countryside. When they finally reach their destination, they first come across the destroyed and abandoned side of town, so the group begins discussing how to proceed as young Xiao Hubei tells his uncle that his brother is gone. His brother is Duan Wu, who has gone exploring to see what's going on. He discovers there are Japanese soldiers in the area and these soldiers see him in return, so they charge after him and find the rest of the Chinese troops. Duan Wu grabs his brother and his uncle so they can hide together and escape by sneaking around through the ruins of buildings while their group is killed. When night falls, they reach the nicer still inhabited part of Shanghai, only to find the NRA shooting fellow Chinese soldiers for being deserters. Afraid of being labeled deserters as well, they look for another group to join in order to cross safely, and eventually they find a machine gun company they can join. These soldiers are deserters as well, but at least they are being taken to a Shanghai warehouse where they're needed instead of executed. This is the Sihang Warehouse, the last standing stronghold between Shanghai and the Japanese army. Commander Zhu Shengzhong isn't happy to have deserters working with him and wants to kill them, but Lieutenant Colonel Xie Jinyuan tells him they're going to need all the help they can get, so he sends the new arrivals to work outside on the fortifications. Duan Wu takes the chance to talk to the colonel and clarify he and his family aren't deserters, just part of the troops sent by the Wangpi headquarters that got left behind, but Jinyuan sends them to work anyway. While the group is working outside, one of the soldiers sounds the alarm, but it's nothing to worry about. It isn't the Japanese that are coming, just a group of Chinese refugees heading for the international Shanghai settlement. Duan Wu's uncle sneaks out of the warehouse to join them and try to enter the safety of the settlement, but at the gates, he isn't allowed to enter because he is wearing an army uniform and soldiers are not authorized to be there. Back in the warehouse, the soldiers enjoy the beautiful singing from a woman in a building across the river while Hubei befriends the only other boy his age in the group called Xiao Kuai Yue. On the roof of the warehouse, Kuai Yue shows Hubei the stark difference between the worlds at the front and the back of the building. Meanwhile, a group of soldiers finds a hole in the wall hidden behind a bunch of boxes. When they go through it, they are surprised to find a stable with a white horse still in it. As soon as they open the stall door though, the horse gets spooked and runs out, but thankfully Kuai Yue whistles at the horse and calms it down before it gets shot. The next day, worry takes over the civilians in the streets when they suddenly hear explosions and notice the Japanese have taken over yet another building waving their flags as a sign of victory. Thinking the warehouse is low in defense, next the Japanese try to take over it as well, but it is all a trap. The Chinese army has been hiding to ambush them and manages to quickly defeat them, thanks to the element of surprise. Duan Wu's group is still seen as deserters though, so they are not allowed to fight. They wait in a locked room and are only let out when the battle is over. One of them tries to run away, but he's immediately shot for trying to desert again. Duan Wu joins the soldiers in clearing and looting the bodies, although he doesn't dare to kill any enemy that is still alive like the others do. However, there still are Japanese troops outside the warehouse, and they retaliate by throwing gas bombs through the windows. All soldiers run to find cover, grabbing towels to pee on them and cover their faces to protect themselves from the gas. Fear and worry make it impossible for Duan Wu to relieve himself, but thankfully another officer lends him his mask. The gas begins to leak out of the building and reaches the settlement, causing civilians to panic and push each other in the streets while trying to enter any building, which proves difficult because owners are locking the doors. At the warehouse, the soldiers are starting to successfully remove the gas, but Duan Wu accidentally gets pushed over and he falls into an underground canal he didn't know about. He decides to explore around a little, and that's how he discovers there's an entrance that can easily be used to sneak in and out of the warehouse. In the meantime, Mr. Fang Xingwen, a Chinese journalist, approaches the Japanese army to sell them all the information he has about the warehouse troops. This is well received by Japanese Colonel Konoe Isao, who immediately begins planning a new attack. Back in the warehouse, the soldiers have opened the doors to take out all the bodies, which allows the horse to escape and run through the streets. The civilians see it and follow the animal's escape, taking it as a good sign. This provides a good distraction from the cruelty happening at the building the Japanese took over. They have captured Chinese soldiers and are now displaying their bodies on poles as they demand the warehouse troops to surrender. Duan Wu is devastated to find out one of those bodies is his uncle, but he doesn't have time to grieve because his group is gathered to kill the few Japanese prisoners they have as an answer to the taunting. The deserters don't want to do this, thinking it is going too far, but Commander Sheng Zhang shoots one of them and threatens to do the same to the others if they don't follow orders. The soldiers begin shooting the prisoners, yet even under threat, Duan Wu can't bring himself to do it. To save him from getting killed, one of his superiors grabs Duan Wu and reminds him the Japanese killed his uncle, so an angry Duan Wu finally pulls the trigger. Later, when night falls, Kwai Yue shares a special snack with Hubei while Duan Wu tries to convince his superiors to let him and his brother go because they are just farmers that weren't made for this. Since his request is rejected, Duan Wu decides to return to the underground canal to see if he can escape. Two other deserters find him and join him, but on their way out, they find Japanese troops sneaking in through the same tunnel. 
The trio hides underwater against the wall and waits for the Japanese to pass by, but they hold their breath for so long that they lose one of their friends. Duan Wu and his remaining friend rush toward the exit and are seen by civilians, so they pretend they aren't escaping and instead warn everyone about the Japanese army attacking. The police turn their lights at the warehouse while the civilians raise an alarm, and such warning is a godsend. The Chinese army wakes up and immediately raises their defenses, earning them a victory with only a few losses. Outside, the civilians praise Duan Wu and his companion for being heroes, even inspiring three young schoolboys to join the troops. But when they go back inside, they are still scolded by Colonel Jin Yuan, who suspects what they were actually trying to do when getting into the tunnels. As punishment, they are set out to fix their defenses. The next day, civilians once again begin panicking when they notice bigger Japanese troops are approaching. Mr. Fang takes advantage of his intel to take bets on the results of the incoming battle from foreigners, although he doesn't gamble himself. A few hours later, the Japanese finally come close enough to attack, and the warehouse troops are soon so overwhelmed that the deserters, including the brothers and the schoolboys, are given weapons in order to fight. The battle is brutal and both sides are losing men at an alarming rate, so Hubei is doing his best to sneak around and survive. However, when he peeks out a window and notices the white horse running by, he can't help telling Kwai Yue about it. This causes Kwai Yue to try to look at the horse too, but as soon as his head sticks out, he gets shot by the enemy. While the Chinese army is smaller in numbers, they know their strategy well and make use of various plans to defend their city. They make holes in the wall to shoot out grenades, use mirrors to follow the enemy's movements, and when they have no other choice, the soldiers strap explosives to their bodies and charge toward the Japanese to blow up a good amount of their troops. Civilians across the river are moved by these sacrifices and decide to help, so they send a group of volunteers hiding under a Nazi flag to deliver supplies. A Japanese sniper kills a few of them, making them lose the phone line, so another civilian man sacrifices himself to run across the bridge and roll the wire over as he is shot down. Now the warehouse can communicate with the city, and when they are asked how many soldiers are left, Colonel Jinyuan decides he wants to give people hope, so he responds 800 instead of the real 452. One of the civilians that came over under the flag is Mr. Fang, who begins filming and taking pictures of the soldiers. Duan Wu's friend steals Mr. Fang's coat to try to escape because he is scared and wants to see his wife, but Duan Wu stops him, almost shooting him too and only deciding not to do so when he sees him ask for mercy. Meanwhile, Hubei is grieving the loss of Kwai Yue, so Commander Sheng Zhang offers him a drink. Hubei ends up grabbing the whole bottle while he watches the city lights. There is a donation collection happening in the streets and every civilian is eager to collaborate after seeing the sacrifices in battle. Not to risk another incident like the bridge, this time they slingshot the supplies, reaching the soldiers through the windows of the warehouse. The casino owner surprises everyone by donating a flag, and a young girl crosses the river by swimming to take the flag to the troops. Duan Wu sees her and tosses a rope through the window to help her get inside, which causes a hidden sniper to shoot at him, but at least the bullet only grazes the neck and now Hubei thinks of him as a hero. Afterward, Colonel Jin Yuan informs his troops that the Generalissimo wants them to defend the warehouse for two more days to gain worldwide attention. However, this could possibly mean they shouldn't raise the donated flag because it would taunt the enemy, provoking them to fight harder while they lack the men to counterattack. A huge argument begins among the soldiers and while the answers are mixed, the majority votes for one conclusion. They shall raise the flag anyway. The next morning, the deserters are tasked to raise the flag on the roof of the warehouse, which earns them the cheer of the civilians. The Japanese army wastes no time in attacking, and their fighter planes concentrate on specifically targeting the flag. While the Chinese troops are losing many men by the second, they still hold onto the flag to keep it up, so the Japanese turn to attack the civilians too. Because there are foreigners there, they receive a message saying this may be seen as an act of war by the other nations. The flag eventually falls, and while the Chinese decide to stop attacking to avoid unnecessary sacrifices, they still raise the flag again. Fortunately, the Japanese begin to retreat when they receive objections from the British, so Duan will begin celebrating their victory before he realizes he has been shot. With his last breath, he asks Mr. Fang to take a picture of him for his brother. Later, while Hubei is once again watching the city and grieving another loss, the white horse shows up and allows him to pet at his comfort. That night, Colonel Jin Yuan reenacts an old Chinese tale of war with a map and a puppet to remind his troops of the importance of what they're protecting. The following day, the British put a Red Cross flag outside the settlement to mark it as a safe zone. Colonel Isao comes over in a black horse to talk, so Colonel Jin Yuan meets him by riding the white horse. It turns out Isao will be replaced by another colonel soon, and he knows the Chinese will receive orders to retreat. So for the sake of their honor and to be seen less as a failure, he requests one last battle. Colonel Jin Yuan accepts and rushes back to the warehouse to get the troops ready. Hiding under an English flag, the commissioner comes over to give an order to retreat to the settlement at midnight. This is not accepted by Colonel Jin Yuan, who thinks that if they continue to fight they may inspire the international community to help. Sadly, the commissioner already knows nobody is coming. After the NRA fell, 
The rest of the world lost interest in their conflict. The higher-ups have decided it is better to accept the loss. It may be not honorable, but the country has suffered enough. This upsets Colonel Jin Yuan, who thinks these orders make all their sacrifices lose their meaning. When night falls, the searchlights are turned off so that the soldiers can retreat through the bridge, but a small group will have to stay behind to provide cover. Mr. Fang takes pictures and letters from this group, promising to take them home to their families. While the civilians flood the streets to watch the soldiers cross the bridge, Hubei decides to stay behind as one of the defenders. The Japanese soon turn on their own searchlights, firing a flare to light up the area and make it easier for them to attack the soldiers on the bridge. The group of volunteers leaves the warehouse to approach the Japanese camp in an attempt to slow them down, but they quickly get shot. Civilians try to help as well, B by reaching out with medical supplies or shooting with their own weapons from the balconies of their homes. Little by little, most of the Chinese troops are killed, including Colonel Jin Yuan, so only a handful of men make it to the settlement, where the civilians are reaching out to them through the gates. In modern-day Shanghai, the White Horse emerges from the ruins of the warehouse. These ruins are still up as a memory of the sacrifice that allowed China to be the main battleground for the anti-fascist war in the Orient. The Chinese army accounts for 70% of Japanese casualties in the Second World War. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos like this. Thanks for watching.